In this assignment, we're going to read the Royal Proclamation of October 7th, 1763. And after we're finished reading this, we're going to answer one question here on Google Classroom. It's a short answer question in the assignment. And you're going to explain to me in what ways the 13 colonies were subjects of the British monarchy. So we're looking at how the colonies were not independent yet. And you're going to explain in what ways they remained dependent on their colonial rule. Annotation. After the Seven Years' War was over, Britain controlled all of North America east of the Mississippi. Settlers from the 13 colonies were anxious to move into the Ohio Valley now that it was free of French influence. But the lands were still in the possession of Indian nations, who were rightly suspicious of Yankee motives and resented their intrusion. Pontiac's rebellion along the frontier began in August of 1763. At the same time, Britain was moving to consolidate its gains and implement governing structures. The new territories would be organized into four areas, Quebec, East Florida, West Florida, and the island of Grenada. This is set out as the opening paragraphs of the proclamation and details of their governance and se settlement in later sections. The lands west of the Appalachian height of land were reserved for the Indians as their hunting grounds. They were not included in any colony and colonists were expressly forbidden to enter into land negotiations with the Indians because of great frauds and abuses. And the, crowd, the crown reserved to itself the exclusive right to negotiate cessions of Indian title. At the same time, settlement was forbidden. While the Indian nations governed the proclamation territory under their own laws, the crown also directed the non-Aboriginal fugitives from justice could could be pursued and taken into Indian lands. In Canada, the proclamation is the basis of our understanding of the legal nature of Indian title and an historical root of the treaty process. Its provisions underlie the surrenders and designations of reserve land, which still take place pursuant of the Indian Act. In the practice, practice of proclamation failed the stifle expansionist ambitions in the 13 colonies. The Crown used the Quebec Act in 1774 as a device to reassert its control over the proclamation lands by extending the former boundaries of Quebec down to the Ohio River near what is now Pittsburgh, then down the Ohio, the Mississippi, and north to Rupert's Land. This was one of the complaints advanced by the colonists two years later in their Declaration of Independence. Historical events subsequently excluded much of the proclamation territory from British control and from Canada. Subsequ um, but it is still relevant to the development of Canadian law. The proclamation is now formally part of the Constitution of Canada, but is referred to in Section 25 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The headings included in the text below are for convenience. They are not part of the original text. It should also be noted that the map is also a reference tool. It is not an official map, and the courts have since applied the proclamation to areas not shown on it on it as Indian Territory. The full extent of the territorial application of the Proclamation of Canada is still subject to dispute, and there is little doubt that its reach as a foundation of our Aboriginal law is much broader. So this is from 1763, and we can see the 13 colonies here. We uh, go from Florida all the way up through the eastern coast of the United States to the boundaries of Canada. So this is the text of the Royal Proclamation, its purpose. Whereas we have taken into our royal consideration the extensive and valuable acquisitions in America, secured by our crown by the late definitive treaty of peace concluded at Paris on the 10th day of February last, and being desirous of all our living subjects, as well as our kingdoms as of our colonies in America, may avail themselves with all convenient speed of the great benefits and advantages which must accrue therefrom to our commerce, manufacturers, and navigation. We have thought fit with the advice of our Privy Council to issue this our royal proclamation, hereby to publish and declare to all our loving subjects that we have, with the advice of our said Privy Council, granted our letters patent under our great seal of Great Britain to erect within the countries and islands ceded and confirmed to us by the said treaty 
four district and separate governments styled and called by the names of Quebec, East Florida, West Florida, and Grenada, and limited and bounded as follows this. First, the government of Quebec bounded on the labor on the Labrador coast by the River Street St. John, and from thence by a line drawn from the head of the river through the Lake St. John to the south end of the Lake Nipsing, from whence the side lane, from whence the side line crossing the River St. Lawrence and the Lake Champlain, Champlain in 45 degrees of north latitude paces along the highlands which divide the rivers that attempt themselves into the coast of the Bays de Ch Chaleurs and the coast of the Gulf with St. Lawrence to Cape Rosaries, and from thence crossing the mouth of the river St. Lawrence by the west end of the island of Anacosti terminates at the aforesaid river of St. John. Secondly, the government of East Florida bounded but to the westward by the Gulf of Mexico and the Appalachia River, to the northward by a line drawn that part of the said river where the Chacachoke and the Flint Rivers meet, to the source of St. Mary's River, and by the course of the said river to the Atlantic Ocean and to the eastward and southward of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Florida, including all islands within six leagues of the sea coast. Thirdly, the government of West Florida bounded to the southward by the Gulf of Mexico, including all islands within six leagues of the coast from the river Apalachicola to Lake Puchachirin, and the westward by the said lake, the Lake Maripas and the river Mississippi, to the northward by the line drawn due east from that part of the river Mississippi, which lies 31 degrees north latitude to the river Apachicola and Chachachui and the eastward by the said river. Fourthly, the governor of Grenada, comprehending the island of that name, together with the Grenadines and the island of Dominico, St. Vincent's and Tobago, and to the end and the open and free fishery of our subjects may be extended to and carried on upon the coast of Labrador and the adjacent islands. We have thought fit with the advice of our said Privy Council to put all this that coast from the River St. John's to Hudson Straits, Straits, together with the islands of Anacosti and Madeleine, and all other smaller islands lying upon the, the said coast under the care and inspection of our Governor of Newfoundland. We have also, with the advice of our Privy Council, thought fit to annex the island of St. John's, now Prince Edward Island, and Cape Breton, or Isle Royale, with the lesser islands adjacent thereto, to our government of Nova Scotia. We have also, with the advice of our Privy Council aforesaid, annexed to our province of Georgia all the lands lying between the rivers Altamaha and St. Mary's. So it's interesting to see what, um, like, rivers and landmarks and boundaries have remained the same names. Granada is still an island off of Florida, and Florida still has its name Florida, and Nova Scotia up in Canada, and then what names we no longer use for those territories. So new governments to have general assemblies and make laws. And whereas it will greatly contribute to the speedy settling of our said new governments, that our loving subjects should be informed of our pr pr paternal care for the security of the liberties and properties of those who are and shall become inhabitants thereof, we have thought fit to publish and declare by our, by this our proclamation that we have in the letters patent under our great seal of Great Britain, by which the said governments were, are constituted, given express power and direction to our governors of our said colonies respectively. And so soon as the state and circumstances of the said colonies will admit thereof they shall, with the advice and consent of the members of our council, summon and call general assemblies within the, the said governments respectively, in such manner and form as is used and directed in those colonies and provinces in America, which are under our immediate government. And we have also given power to the said governors with the consent of our said councils and the representatives of the people, so to be summoned as aforesaid to make constitute and ordain laws, statutes, and ordinances for the public peace, welfare, and good government of our said colonies, and of the people and inhabitants thereof, 
as near as may be agreed, agreeable to the laws of England and under such regulations and restrictions as are used in other colonies, and in the meantime, and until such assemblies can be called as aforesaid, all persons and restrictions as are used in other colonies and in the meet all persons inhabiting in or resorting to their said colonies may confide in our royal protection for the enjoyment of the benefit of the laws of our realm of England, for which purpose we have given power under our great seal to the governors of our said colonies, respectively to erect the constitution with the advice of our said councils, respectively, courts of juricature and public justice, within our said colonies for hearing and determining all causes, as well as criminal as civil, according to law and equity, and as near as may be agreeable in the laws of England with the liberty to all persons who may think themselves aggrieved by the sentences of such courts in all civil cases to appeal under the usual limitations and restrictions to us and our privy council. So this um, shows us that the territory that they outlined in the previous section is going to be ruled by a governor and that governor would then be ruled by in this case the uh, colonial power which was england now our governors are ruled by our federal government of the united states as an independent country and we still have governors each state has its own governor the governor is basically the you know, president of the state. They're the leader, they make the final decisions, and then they have a Congress of legislature, legislative branch, as is outlined here, where it says that they go to court, so they have a judicial system within the state, and they also have um, a legislative that creates laws. And we would call our state legislature our house of representatives and our senate and those two bodies make up our congress so we can see in this document that a lot of the um ways that the colonies were organized and structured back even back as far as 1763 when they were being established before we were even an independent country before we had our own federal constitution that each state had outlined its um, boundaries and its how it was going to govern itself, how it would make laws. And we have retained much of that same system. During this time when it was a colony, they were held accountable by England, whereas today we are united by a federal government. Grants for settlement. We have also thought fit with the advice of our Privy Council as aforesaid, to give unto the governors and councils of our said three new colonies upon the con continent full power and authority to settle and agree with the inhabitants of our new our said new colonies with or with any other persons who shall resort thereto for such lands tenements and hereditament as are now or hereafter shall be in our power to dispose of and them to grant to such person or persons upon such terms and under such moderate quit rents, services, and acknowledgments, as have been appointed and settled in our other colonies and under such other conditions as shall appear to us to be the necessary and expedient for the advantage of the grantees and the improvement and settlement of our said colonies. So here they're describing how the Colonies felt that they should have the authority to be able to grant land as settlements to um, gift to people. For, um, for example, uh, the land that my home is on where I grew up in Virginia was actually a land grant. So it's a large piece of land and I, was, um, I had the only house on it. And that had been given to the person, the, the original owner as a grant through the colony for some favor that the person who received it had given. Basically, instead of receiving money or payment, they were bartering land, and the colonies wanted the authority to be able to do that. Soldier Settlement And whereas we are desirous upon all occasions to testify our royal sense and approbation of the conduct and bravery of the officers and soldiers of our armies, and to reward the same, we do hereby command and empower our governors of our said three new colonies 
and all other our governors of our several provinces and of the continent of North America to grant without fee or reward to such reduced officers as have served in North America during the late war and to such private soldiers as have been or shall be disbanded in America and are actually residing there and shall personally apply for the same. The following quantities of land subject at the expiration of 10 years to the same quit rents as other lands are subject to in the province within which they are granted, as also subject to the same conditions of cultivation and improvement. To every person having the rank of a field officer, 5,000 acres. To every captain, 3,000 acres. To every subaltern or staff officer, 2,000 acres. To every non-commissioned officer, 200 acres. And to every private man, 50 acres. So we can see that by serving in the armed forces, the colonies wanted to grant land to depending on the rank that they held within the army in compensation for their service defending the country. We do likewise authorize and require the governors and commanders in chief of all our said colonies upon the continent of North America to grant the like quantities of land and upon the same conditions to such reduced officers of our Navy of like rank as served on board our ships of war in North America at the times of the reduction of Louisbourg and Quebec in the late war, and who shall personally apply to our respective governors for such grants. The Indian Provisions And whereas it is just and reasonable and essential to our interest in the security of our colonies, that the several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected, and who live under our protection, should be not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of their dominions and territories, as not having been ceded to or purchased by us, are reserved to them or any of them as their hunting grounds. We do therefore, with the advice of our Privy Council, declare it to be our royal will and pleasure that no governor or commander-in-chief in any of their colonies of Quebec, East Florida, or West Florida do presume, upon any pretense whatever, to grant warrants of survey or pass any patents of, for land beyond the bounds of their respective governments. As described in their commissions, as also with that no governor or commander-in-chief in any other colony or plantation in America do presume for the present and until our future pleasure be known, to grant warrants of survey to pass patents or any lands beyond the heads or sources of any of the rivers which fall into the Atlantic Ocean from the west and northwest, or upon any lands whatever, which not having been ceded or purchased by us as aforesaid, are reserved to the said Indians or any of them. And we do further declare in our royal will and pleasure for the presence as aforesaid to reserve under our sovereignty, protection, and dominion for the use of the said Indians, all of the lands and territories not included within the limits of our said three new governments or within the limits of the territory granted to the Hudson's Bay Company, as also all the lands and territories lying to the westward and the source of the sources of the rivers which fall into the sea from the west and northwest as aforesaid. And we do hereby strictly forbid, on pain of their displeasure, all our loving subjects from making any purchase of settlements, whatever, or taking possession of any of the lands above reserved without or a special leave and license for the purpose first obtained. And we do further strictly enjoin and require all persons wherever who have either willfully or inadvertently seated themselves upon any lands within the countries above described or upon any other lands which not having been ceded or purchased by us are still reserved to the said Indians as aforesaid forthwith to remove themselves from such settlements. And whereas... And whereas great frauds and abuses have been committed in purchasing lands of the Indians to the great prejudice of our interest and to the great disfaction of the said Indians, in order therefore to prevent such irregularities to, for the future and to end that the Indians may be convinced of our justice and determined resolution to remove all reasonable cause of discontent, we do with the advice of our Privy Council strictly enjoin and require that no private person do presume to make any purchase from the said Indians of any lands reserved to the said Indians within those parts of their, our colonies where we have thought proper to allow settlement. 
but that if at any time any of the said Indians should be inclined to dispose of the said lands, the same shall be purchased only for us and our name at some, some public meeting or assembly of the said Indians to be held for that purpose by the governor or commander of the chief and chief of their colony, respectively within which they shall lie. And in case they shall lie within the limits of any proprietary government, they shall be purchased only for use with this name of such proprieties, conformable to such direction and instruction as we or they shall think proper to give for that purpose. And we do, by the advice of our privy council, declare and enjoin with the trade with the said Indians shall be free and open to all other subjects, whatever, provided that every person who may be may incline to trade with the said Indians do take out the license for carrying on such trade from the governor or commander-in-chief of any of our colonies, respectively, where such person shall reside, and also give security to observe with regulations as we shall at any time think fit by ourselves or by our commissaries to be appointed for this purpose, to direct and appoint for the benefit of the said trade. And we do hereby authorize and join and require the governors and commander in chiefs of our colonies respectively, as well as those under immediate government, as those under the government and direction of proprietaries to grant such licenses without fee or reward, taking a special care to insert therein a condition that which license shall be void and the security forfeited in case the person to whom the same is granted shall refuse or neglect to observe such regulations as we shall think proper to prescribe as aforesaid. And we do further express, conjoin, and require all officers, whatever, as well military as those employed in the management and direction of Indian affairs, within the territories reserved as aforesaid to the use and said Indians, to seize and apprehend all persons, whatever, who standing charged with treason, misprisons mis of treason, murders, or with other felonies or misdemeanors, shall fly from justice and take refuge in the said territory, and to send them under a proper guard to the colony where the crime was committed, of which they stand accused, in order to take their trial for the same. Given at our Court of St. James on the 7th day of October, 1763, in the third year of our reign. God save the King. So, in this final portion, we see that they are allocating which lands will be in possession of the Native Americans, and they essentially are saying that the colonizers, like private citizens, wouldn't be able to confiscate that land from Indians, that it's reserved for them. But if the Indians were to abandon the land, then the land would go directly to the government entity. It would not go to a private citizen. So that's kind of the gist of that document. So in this assignment, you're going to just explain in what ways you believe that the colonies were subjects of the British monarchy? What, what do we see evidence of that in this royal proclamation that they were still a colony of, the, of England of another country rather than functioning independently? If you have any questions as you're working, feel free to reach out and ask so that I can help and support you.